Hello. Okay, much of the work that we do at the uh, Historic Preservation Commission is associated with uh, review of construction projects. Uh, the purpose of these reviews is to um, identify um, cultural resources, meaning um, important Native American or historic resources um, that may be threatened by those construction projects that um, are at least partially funded with uh, federal monies. In 2009, we received notification from the Department of Transportation, I gotta juggle a little bit here, um, that the bridge over uh, the Kennebec River between Dresden and Richmond uh, was nearing the end of its use life and um, they were planning to build a new bridge and uh, wanted to know um, if there was a possibility of cultural resources that would be affected with this project or by this project. Um, we um, conducted a um, uh, an investigation, a rough investigation looking at uh, historic maps and um, some brief documentary research and decided that there were def was definitely a high potential for um, cultural resources there. We, the, our office happens to do the mitigation work for the Department of Transportation, so that means that we would actually do the work ourselves. It doesn't go out to a, an archaeological contractor. Um, this is just a um, 50s era map uh, showing the location of the bridge on the Kennebec River, the north end of Swan Island, and uh, the town of Richmond in the foreground. Um, in conducting uh, the initial survey, the phase one archaeological survey, um, the DOT initially did not know where the new bridge was going to be located. Um, as you can see, the, the actual site of the bridge, um, the whole, um, this whole area was potentially a new location for the bridge, considerably upstream as well as uh, potentially a little bit downstream. Um, that meant that approach roads um, on both sides of the river in Dresden and, and Richmond um, could potentially be within that area. Um, we uh, conducted archaeological archeological survey of um, all of those areas. Uh, we stratified them, and the area that we were um, had learned was of greatest potential was right in here, uh, in the area of what's called, historically called Thwaites Point. Um, this is how the area looks today. <clears throat> um, this is the ferry historic ferry landing, the old ferry road coming down the approach road that was put in uh, to the bridge in 1930 in um, Jill and Paul Adams' house. Uh, this, the site is where we've been doing most of our work is right in front of that house. Okay, um, in conducting archeological surveys, obviously a fair bit of our time initially is involved with trying to find out about the history of the site. Much of what we know about the site was actually um, researched in 1893 uh, by the Reverend Henry O'Thayer. Uh, he was an excellent um, late 19th century historian. And so what I'm gonna run through very quickly is uh, uh, what he uh, documented for the history of the site, and then, then we, we go from there. So the earliest historic occupation um, is Alexander Thwaite, um, hence the name uh, Thwaites Point. Um, he's there as early as 1649, um, moves upriver uh, by 1668. He spends some time in Bath at Winnegans during that time period. Um, he's supposed to have had a trading post and obviously probably lived on the site for a period of time. Oops. Okay. Um, and the, by the um, 1670s, of course, uh, King Philip's War, comes up, um, all of the Europeans uh, run south, um, the whole area is um, empty of um, other than Native Americans, and then by the very early 18th century, uh, Europeans start slowly coming back into the area. Um, by 1714, a group of men out of Boston, known as the Pajapscot Proprietors, um, obtained control of a large portion of the land on either side of the river in this area. <coughs> And um, by 1719, they are doing their best to try to encourage settlement in the area. Unfortunately, they're not terribly successful because there are also a lot of Native Americans who aren't really happy to have Europeans there. 
Um, the proprietors um, petitioned the general court in Boston saying um, we need a fort, um, we need protection from the Indians uh, if we're going to get settlers here and allow us to make lots of money. And so the general court responds saying, no, we're not gonna build you a fort, but we will provide 40 soldiers uh, if you build them a barracks. So by 1721, um, the uh, barracks is constructed, actually uh, the number of 40 soldiers was reduced to 20, and then it was, a, few, a number of soldiers probably went AWOL and they ended up with 14 coming up. Um, they probably stayed on Swan Island initially in an existing house and then uh, moved to Thwaites Point to a garrison. This computer has a mind of its own. Okay, um, this is the uh, Heath 1719 map. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, um, point, the, the site of Fort Richmond is located there just north of Swan Island. Um, and Thayer uh, noted that the fact that this map is dated 1719 and the fort could not be earlier than 1721 meant that the fort, Richmond Fort, was added to the map at a later date. Okay, the fort itself, what we know of that, um, it was first constructed in 1723 as a result of two Indian raids in 1721 and 1722. Um, we don't know what, those, what the extent of those raids was. Um, whether uh, the Indians yelled obscenities at the English and um, just pissed them off or what the story was, but um, they nevertheless petitioned for the fort um, and finally the uh, Boston court said, okay, we'll build you the fort. Um, as you can see, the basic descriptions of it, um, I just want to point out 70 feet square is not very big. Um, also, the Indian house, um, this was also known as the McCoy house. The English were allied with the Mohawk Indians and the Mohawks um, were no, known as not being very friendly to local native tribes. And the uh, local native tribes were deathly scared of the Mohawks as a result. And so the English felt if they could keep, in, keep a line, an alliance with the Mohawks, and, and to the extent of providing lodging for them, should they come, that it would help to keep the local Indians uh, in, in check, basically. Um, we don't know if that structure was inside or outside the fort, but some, a little issue with that will come up later. Um, let's see, also the truck house. Um, one of the reasons for constructing this fort was the establishment of a trading post uh, that would not only provide um, goods for potential settlers, but would also serve as a means of engendering good relations with uh, local, local Native Americans. Uh, the truck house was not uh, as actually established until the early 1730s. Okay, by 1740, due to the threat of war with Spain, um, the uh, general court decides to upgrade its coastal defenses, including Fort Richmond. They essentially take down the old fort um, and uh, reconstruct the fort and make it larger. Um, and these are just a number of the structures uh, that Thayer was able to determine would have been in that later fort. Um, historically, I mean, more recent historians and archaeologists haven't known exactly where the fort was located um, and also the two different forts. There were hypotheses that the, the first fort may have been upriver or downriver. It was fairly well agreed that the later fort was um, in the general location of Thwaites Point. Okay, the fort is taken down, decommissioned in 1755. Um, one of our questions was, what does decommissioning mean? At that time, they left up the chapel and at least one building uh, because um, Jacob Bailey um, actually lived there with his wife for a brief period of time. Um, then no one seems to be in the area um, until about 1775 to 76 when John Parks um, <coughs> builds a large fort in the, a large house in the fort and also his family establishes the ferry, which was um, running almost until the uh, 1930 bridge was put in place. Um, in 1827, the park's house is abandoned, uh, may have burned, uh, may have also been abandoned due to land um, uh, um, issues, uh, disagreements. And then by 1891, James Hathorne builds his new house on the old park cellar. And this was all supposed to be in the fort, in the site of the fort. Um, this is the site of the ferry landing. <coughs> um, up on the hill here is um, James Hathorne's house, uh, supposedly in the, the fort. By 1930, um, DOT is building the new bridge. 
Um, this is the original location of the house. It was then later moved uh, across the ac um, access road to the uh, north side of Route 197. Um, this is a, a DOT map, sort of, um, showing the original location, if you can see right there, and then they moved it right up across the road. Okay, this is approximately what it looks like today. Just to um, point out the area on the south side, as many of you know, of, uh, is a park owned by the Department of Transportation. On the north is um, the um, house of Jill and Paul Adams. Uh, what we know visually of the fort, what it looked like, is practically nothing. Um, this is from a 1930s era travel brochure, a conjectural view. Um, this is another conjectural view. Uh, from uh, the late 19th century from a Boston historian. In 1937, uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution uh, dedicated uh, the site or, or um, ded dedicated the fort as uh, the site as, um, fort as the, the site of Fort Richmond. They actually didn't know exactly where the fort was, but they knew it was in this area. And they set up a stone with a, a bronze tablet on it, which is still there today. The flagpole that you see there we actually took down very carefully, um, hoping that it might be able to be reused. So it was, was um, still in very good shape from that time. Um, one of the things that we are blessed with with this project is the uh, ledger book of John Minot. John Minot was the uh, truck master or head of the trading post at the fort. Um, a, an article was written about this document, uh, which is at the uh, Maine Historical Society back in the 1980s. Uh, we went down to look at it to get a sense of what kind of information was in it. Um, it's an unbelievable document. It, it um, details um, individual items um, that were purchased um, by um, uh, different uh, uh, pe people who were associated with the fort, including Native Americans. Um, talks about different tasks that people were doing. There are accounts for uh, bills billing the province of Massachusetts for construction supplies to give us evidence of uh, what kind of work was being done at the fort construction-wise. Um, what was <coughs> kind of unique about this is that Fred Kerber, a um, uh, past um, history professor, history teacher at Brunswick High School, um, offered to do some research, help us with some research, uh, looking at the Pajepscott records at uh, Pajepscott Historical Society. So he, he um, emailed me and said he's, he's really enjoying going through the Minot Journal. And so we, we talked. And I said, um, is, it, do you, is it a copy, copy of the Minot Journal? Because the original's at Maine Historical. And he said, oh, no, this is an original document. <laughs> um, so I said, well, that's funny. Well, but what years is it? Uh, 1731 to 1737. Well, the uh, document at Maine Historical is 1737 to 1742. It turns out um, that uh, the Scott Society has Ledger A, uh, Main Historical has Ledger B. There are references from Ledger A to Ledger B. It's a continuation of the accounts carried forward. Neither institution knew of the existence of the other. Um, just the other day when we were down at Main Historical, looking through some of the other Pajepscott records, uh, we actually came across a set of about 16 pages um, that are in a separate folder um, that also go to the Ledger B book that's in their collection. So now they've joined those 16 back um, to that document. Um, so that is something that we have for the f in the future um, to help to tell us a lot about um, what actually uh, occurred at the site and to be able to compare it to the archaeology. Um, as far as the archaeological survey that was conducted, um, it we, and we started off with a pretty much standard uh, procedure, um, excavating a whole series of shovel test pits, about one foot by one foot uh, pits. We dig down um, as deep as we can to subsoil. Um, the purpose is to look for uh, cultural, any, anything cultural, uh, foundations, stains in the soil, post holes. Also, we screen the soil looking for artifacts that will give us an indication of the time period and, and presence of, of different people. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is start talking about just um, the area where we started in the park, um, just to, uh, to give you a sense. Um, you know, the color is really strange here. But anyway, um, just a couple of the shovel tests. Right off, we started finding 18th century artifacts. These are foundation stones. 
Um, at this point, we weren't opening anything up. This is just our phase one survey to make a determination of the um, preservation of the site and to try to, to determine what is actually there. Another one of those um, as shovel test pits came down on stones. We just left them in place. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you now is um, an area right here where we opened up for our phase two. Uh, so from those stones, we found a section of, of stone wall um, the two edges are quite a massive stone wall set built into a trench in the ground. Um, this is another view of it, uh, looking north with a, a circle of stones at the south end. Uh, we don't know why, why the stones are there. there was, they weren't surrounding a post of any kind. Some of the artifacts um, associated with those features, um, lead glaze redware that's locally made, Staffordshire slipware from England, um, tin glaze earthenware from um, England and Holland, German stonewares, also a piece of creamware. Creamware is <laughs> from that type is about 1775 to 1820. So that we're talking the Parks family, the Parks occupation, 1775 to about 1827. So we have a mixture of material um, here um, from both the Fort period and the Parks period. So we realized right away that we were going to have issues with, with trying to de um, define between the two. Um, just more, more um, artifacts from that area, gun flints, which are very common on the site, as well as tobacco pipes, um, a coin, I think it was 1798 coin, again from the Parks pe family period. Um, next to the coin is a little piece of uh, either bone or ivory, uh, probably inlay or a, a strut for a, a fan, woman's fan. Um, just a few other artifacts. The large piece in the middle is a Porringer, pewter Porringer handle, a Porringer basin. Actually, in, the, in a 17th century form, um, the, um, it's thought that um, those mold, mold, 17th century molds continued being used in the early 18th century. <clears throat> now, I'm just going to point out this area where the three, we opened up three units. Um, oops. Open up did one excavation unit. These units are one meter by one meter. They're about three feet by three feet. Those are our standard uh, size. And by this point, we had established a horizontal grid over the entire area to give us control. So we, everything gets documented as to exactly where it was found and at what level it was found. Um, we opened up that unit. That unit was lo located up in this area at the top. This is essentially a one meter wide trench. What we found was a massive wall, stone wall here. Um, on the one side of the wall, a nice flat clay floor, as what we thought, with a whole layer of brick on the t uh, lying on the bottom of the floor. On the other side of the wall was, were a bunch more stones. We weren't sure if that was the same wall as we had found earlier, but it was possible. Just a few of the artifacts that were there, tobacco pipes, um, as well as um, pieces of a creamware uh, sugar bowl, again, definitely from the Parks family period, not the fort. Um, now, I'm a little spot over here on one of our shovel test pits going down about two feet hit a small stain right in the corner of the shovel test pit. <clears throat> and this is where good archaeological training really comes through. Um, when you're um, look, working on a site like this, any kind of indications of, of differences in soil coloration, especially given the fact that the soil is horrible clay, um, you really have to pay attention. And so this is actually um, the shovel test pit was right up here. It just hit one, one little edge here. And what we ha actually have is a section of the palisade trench uh, for the fort with the Im impressions of three posts with spaces between them. Um, this was extremely exciting because if, when you're looking for, for a fort um, that had a palisade uh, around it, and once we find the palisade, then you're golden because in theory, everything should be inside of that. Um, so then what this gave us the opportunity to do um, was to try to follow out the palisade to see, see how much of it we could find. And so here we are. That pit was right, right in this location. So we went, um, lined up a tape, and then started doing a whole series of units. Um, so now you can just trace the green. The line's supposed to be green uh, right there. Um, there it is again in one of our other pits. Now <clears throat> we're going in the other direction. Um, we found a corner. Those are um, the different post impressions that were in the corner of the palisade. So at this point, we have a corner, and part of that palisade is facing right up toward the um, Adams's house. So we went across the road, 
um, dug a trench, lined up a tape as best we could. Lo and behold, we have a section of the palisade right in the trench. We continued further past the house up onto the hill, um, and I'll show you a unit right here, right next to the porch. And there it is again. And the actual corner was just past that. And then to make a long story short, um, this, um, this was the corner that we ju had just found. We were able to uh, triangulate basically uh, from this corner. We also found this corner here. So what this ended up being was a uh, palisade about 180 feet by 140 feet. That's a whole lot bigger than anything that, that we had documented. Um, we also determined that this dated to the later fort because there were artifacts in the palisade trench and in the holes um, that the posts were in. And we only did sampling of that. We didn't do much excavating. It was just enough to identify it. Lee, mm -hmm. slide ago, I think you had a long, a long dark stain, rectangular mm -hmm. stain as opposed to a circular post hole. So right. OK, they, um, when they make a, a palisade, um, they dig a long trench. And then they set the posts in it, and then they fill it back in. And so you aren't digging individual post holes. It's one long trench. Uh, so that, that's how, how it was made. And so the posts that you see, the dark stains, are actually where the posts were pulled out of the ground, probably in 1755. And then they dumped soil, topsoil, just down in those holes uh, when, they, when, they, um, uh, when the fort was decommissioned and they cleared the site because there were artifacts in with that dark soil, which again told us that they had filled the holes in. And if there are, are some other some questions as we go, please you know, raise your hand or speak up. <clears throat> All right, now I'm gonna show you real quickly um, just a few of the test pits and some of the results right along this ridge, right along the road cut um, on the north side. We switched, switched to the north side. Um, here we are right along the edge, edge of the cut, the river in the, in the uh, background facing east there. Um, and so just behind where I, had, I was standing in that last photo, um, we down about a foot and a half. Um, we had stones below a thick layer of really nasty clay. We were surprised to find them that deep. Then the, the, another five meters away, um, going toward the east, just under the sod, more stones. And then another five meters to the east, a, a number of stones um, with um, what we were believed was cellar fill, nice soft dark soil with artifacts in it. Another five meters of brick pavement. Another five meters a cobble pavement. Now both the brick pavement and cobble pavement had been documented by Thayer. When he wrote his article, he interviewed some of the workmen who had actually um, extended the cellar of James Hathorne's house in, um, in 1891. And they had said they had encountered these pavements and then with foundations underneath the pavements, and they were intrigued by that. Um, as a result of the testing in this area, we had architectural features all in this area, and then another small area down here. Um, where we thought we had a, a cellar, the, the stones we had found, we opened up a one meter by one meter unit, and here it is. Um, we went down, uh, geez, about five feet, and didn't quite hit the bottom. Um, and some of the artifacts that came out of there, uh, more Staffordshire slipware, lead glaze redware, um, beautiful wrought nails, <clears throat> Imari porcelain from the 1720s to 40s, gun flint, um, also creamware. Um, so this meant, okay, we're still talking the Parks family. Um, it turns out the Parks family dumped their trash all, all over the site. Um, and and hen hence the name, we began calling them really trashy people. Mm. <clears throat> So at the end of our survey, the purpose of doing this work, the phase one and phase two archeological survey was to make a determination if the site uh, as it existed was eligible for listing on the national register. That's the criteria that we have to work for. And so because of the excellent state of preservation of architectural remains and all of those artifacts, um, this was the map that we actually submitted to, to the DOT with our recommendation and the green here are buildings that we suggested, just based on that preliminary testing, uh, were present, as well as potentially an, er an earlier uh, palisade line of some kind for the fort or perimeter line. And then, of course, with the outer, outer um, per perimeter. Um, I will note, make a note on the south side of the road here. Um, we opened up an area first, which we'll talk about, because when they build the new bridge, they have to maintain the old bridge. They have to leave it open. 
but they have to move the road south a little bit so they can um, have more space to work uh, just to the north. The DOT, <coughs> at the same time as we provided them with this information, made the determination that the, the new bridge would go just north of the present bridge and that the new approach road would have to go right across here, just, just north of, of where um, the, the, the present approach road is. Um, they, it was the only thing they could do. It was going to be way too expensive for, the, for them to put it elsewhere. So that triggered um, a phase three or data recovery, as we call it in archaeology. So starting uh, last April, um, we, we began excavating um, in earnest. Um, because the, we had done such, so much testing, we had a really good feeling for what the soils were, and so we used heavy equipment initially to help strip off some of the soil layers um, to make our job easier. So here, there's a, the house across the road, so we opened up this area. <clears throat> um, the area right here was where those three units were in a, in a row. Um, Bill, who works with us, uh, used to cut, trim, tr cut trees for a living. He was happy, you know, or so, fairly happy, to climb up in one of the trees and give us bird's eye view of, of the work we were doing. Here is the base of the flagpole that the DIR put in in 1937. Um, here's that massive stone wall, those original test pits, big stone wall. The area in here um, was very dark, loose soil containing a mixture of artifacts from the Parks period and the Fort period. And just um, and this is you can see there's a, a layer of topsoil we stripped off and all those artifacts are in this nice dark soil um, that was that we were thought may have been inside the fort um, just to clay tobacco pipes that were there quite quite a high density of material um, just one of our, our artifact trays gun flints uh, white salt glazed stoneware from England lots of bone the preservation on the site is very 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 good. Uh, nails, lots of nails, pieces of brick, um, just a, a few other items that were found in that area. Uh, boot buckles. Um, the large item with this is known as a whizzer. Um, it, it's it used essentially like a button. You know, when you were a kid, you'd have strings uh, or a button on strings, and you you do make games with it. Um, these are fairly common actually at fort sites. Uh, pewter button. Um, this object is a piece of glass that's been worked around the edges very carefully the way a Native American would work a stone tool and we believe it's probably a gaming piece. Um, on the right is of course a mouth harp and then the two pieces at the top are pieces of turned lead um, which were used to hold windows in place for leaded windows. <clears throat> um, this is a, one of the more, more unique findings. Um, this is an intaglio um, the image is a little strange, but um, there's an eye, a nose, a chin, um, and I think this is glass. They're often done in crystal, um, but there's, there's a bubble in it there. But <clears throat> in looking at this, um, it almost looks like it's a Native American portrait, because you see these things up on the top of the head that almost look like uh, feathers. We haven't had time to do any research on it. Um, but that would have been set in a ring or, or pendant, you know, some, some kind of, de of jewel decorative jewelry. Um, looking in the other direction, toward the west, here's that big stone wall. Out in this area, um, we determined that there was a brickyard. Um, and this brickyard um, was a, an absolute mess in, in, um, by the mi middle of April. Uh, the rains came and kept coming, and um, it was, was not a lot of fun. Orman Hines there volunteering. Um, it was a real challenge. And what we found is that um, there was a large pit that was dug. Um, the bricks, all the clay was taken out. Bricks were made, and as they made the, fired the bricks, the wasters uh, and material in, in burning them would be pushed back into the hole. Um, what's interesting is that that big stone wall that was there actually was built on top of, that, on, of the hole. So it, it seems like they got carried away when they were making the bricks and dug too far toward the east. And that um, was very important for us because it told us that that, brick, that big stone wall was built after uh, the bricks were being made. All right. Um, now I'm going to shift back. Um, ba um, actually, I'm going to shift up here um, on the north side in this area where we've had one shovel test pit um, with some brick and stones out in the middle of nowhere. When we found this, we thought, oh, geez, maybe this is the site of the Indian house, you know, if it was out uh, away from the fort. 
Um, we cleared the area mechanically, um, opened up the, the original unit. There are a bunch of uh, brick and stone there, uh, continued working on it. Um, and as we were working, uh, we weren't finding many artifacts other than the stone and brick. And this is a little piece of sheet, sheet copper. Normally it looks green, uh, but the color is very off here. Um, sheet copper uh, was very popular among Native Americans. They would use it to make uh, different decorative items, tinkler cones on, on their clothing. Um, and so it was kind of furthered the, the idea that maybe this had uh, location had something to do with, with uh, Native American occupation. Um, these are um, some other pieces of copper that were found in that same area. When we were finished, um, this was the, the whole um, excavation area. We still don't exactly know what it, what it is. Um, we don't think it's the site of the Indian house because it had two chimneys. It was documented to have had two chimneys and there's no evidence of those. Um, this was a uh, wine bottle neck from, the, from there. It's an early uh, 18th century or even 17th century wine bottle neck. Um, and then an air, air twist stem. Um, no other pieces um, <laughs> the, to, to any um, goblets, glass goblets, just that stem. So was that picked up as a, a curio? Um, so we don't know. Um, now returning to sort of the front edge of the yard, began clearing. Um, here we are exposing some of the uh, brick surface um, and in the background, some of the cobble surface. Um, as time went on, I'll just, I'll, I wanna point it, here's the cobble surface and then there's a lar large area of brick surface here. We recognize that the cobbles and the brick came up to a point and stopped and there's a lot of open ground here. In between those areas was, was an in irregular uh, line of stones, large stones. <clears throat> Um, at the same time, there was another line of stones we were able to define here, and in this mess, there's a chimney uh, base, which you'll see in a moment. Um, a shallow cellar, root cellar here, great big piece of iron kettle in it, and there ended up being another cellar in this area. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm showing you lots of different features that we found as we were going, because we're scratching our heads and trying to figure out what all these different things relate to. Um, at the end, I'll make sense, uh, hopefully make sense of all of these things. Um, this was the actual line of stones, one, two, three, four, so it's going right on down. Cobble courtyard on one side, we think in, in the interior of the fort, and this would have been under a building. We had traces of wood associated with some of those stones, so we determined that it was a sill line um, to, a, to a large building. On the east edge, again, of the cobbles, very well defined. Um, by, by stones, those were just stones that were set on top of the cobbles, the larger stones. All right, and this is just a, sort of a, um, an ant's view of, of the um, brick, brick pavement. Now the purpose of this pavement became blatantly obvious while we were there um, with all of, all of the rain. It was really, really rough because this fine clay sticks to your foot and with each step you take practically, your foot gets heavier and heavier. Um, so there was a real functional reason why they had probably almost all ground surfaces covered. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned before, you can see much clearer here this large chimney base, um, and a, a firebox here, another firebox here, and there probably would have been another one here. Um, here's this line of stones much clearer. That line of stones represents the midline of a, very, of a long building. Um, it's perfectly parallel to the line of, of stones out here, which had, had a sill on. So there would have been another beam here. Um, and the fact that there was a firebox also probably facing this way, we had a part of a building here and then a part of the same building back here. Um, and this is this root cellar. I'll show you a few objects from this root cellar. Um, a nice big kettle. Um, all of the items in there uh, were part from the Trashy Parks family. A uh, nice stirrup, um, a um, saucer, a pearlware saucer, uh, dating about 1775 to about 1830. Um, there it is finished with, a, had a wooden floor. <clears throat> um, there are all the artifacts, it's, the color is very strange. But anyway, a lot of creamware plates, um, saucers, pearlware saucers, uh, hand-painted pearlware saucers. Um, they're num um, Let's see, just and some bottle glass as well. Just to, okay, another feature that showed up was a much larger cellar. Um, here we are profiling it. It actually went a little bit deeper than this. 
Um, this was one of the artifacts from that. It's actually a Latin spoon, which is a 17th century form, um, but it's in a um, later 18th century deposit for, of the Parks family. So either it was something they found and tossed in there or was something that they had curated for a period of time and then got rid of it. Um, just, just to give you a sense of the kinds of things we're finding, lots and lots of bone to give us dietary information about the, the people who were living there, um, lots of fish, uh, sheep, goat, um, pig, uh, cow, um, also lots and lots of nails, um, another mouth harp there in the middle. Um, also, while we, while we were there, as we're, as we're working along, we found a, a nine foot diameter cistern. Um, now, part of this was underneath the cobble pavement, okay? So the cistern was there earlier, got filled in, covered over, and then the cobble pavement got put down. All right, this is just showing you, um, this is part of the fill in that uh, cistern. This is this red line here that actually kind of looks like um, a brick, and then this is the wall of the cistern. Um, they wanted that cistern to be as watertight as possible. So what they did, the fact that it was dug into pure clay, they built a huge fire inside it and essentially baked the walls. Um, so that instead of lining it, say, with brick or something and parging it, they just built a fire in it. Um, here's, it, it. You can see about how deep it was. That's an eight-foot ladder going down. So we just sampled it. We just did a section. Um, this is actually a good time to point out this is an earlier fort feature. And it turns out that when they, in 1740, when they took the old fort down and filled in a lot of the features, we would have hoped as archaeologists that it would have been a time where they could throw all of their trash in the cistern, in cellars, uh, for us to find. But no, they cleaned everything up. Were, we, we've jokingly referred to them as a bunch of shakers. They, they cleaned everything up and then used pure hard clay, uh, maybe a few brick, um, a few musket balls, but that's about it that were, were in the fill there. Um, this was a brick and actually one piece of wood uh, that had one end of it worked. Um, now, Ed Murphy, who's here tonight, uh, this is his area. In the road cut, we had initially noticed that there were some stones sticking out of the ground right in, right in the top of the road cut. We, were, we cleared off the this, this sod, identified a wall here. Um, very kindly, um, Ed Murphy took this on as his own little project um, and began uncovering and uh, removing uh, fill and uncovering these walls and following them out. And much to all of our astonishment, um, it ended up looking like this. We had no idea um, what he was going to find. All, so we have one wall here. There's a corner back here. A wall comes out, hit another corner, goes in, another corner and comes out, and then come, come, turns this way out toward the road. So it's like an L-shaped wall. Um, all of this was underneath cobble pavement. So again, thinking association, which is very important in archaeology, um, it's a cellar, a filled cellar, that was then covered over. Um, on very few artifacts in the fill, but on the floor of that cellar, um, a whole pile of um, gun flints, um, also some musket balls and pieces of uh, tobacco pipe. Obviously associated with the early fort period. Okay. So as we worked around uh, further along that road cut, uh, just to point out another uh, chimney base here, um, a few of the artifacts uh, that came out, a beautiful uh, boot buckle. Um, these are actually, um, this cuff link uh, with the uh, Masonic emblem uh, came out, we think, because of the style of the cuff link, it's probably associated with the Parks family, whereas this came from across the street um, and is mo most likely associated with the um, earlier fort, um, and, it's, and it's silver. Um, these are weights um, for a little small balance, um, a brass nesting weight, and this is probably a handmade um, lead weight, possibly with the owner's initials. Um, as we continued toward the end of the season, um, we, where we had excavated that one unit in the uh, cellar, or what we thought was a cellar, uh, we wanted to open up at least part of it in, in, uh, to know what we might be up against come this spring. And so in working in this area, uh, right up toward the top, um, we were finding parks period material. This is a gun lock, a floor flintlock rifle. Um, and it actually has a lot of the pieces, you know, the parts on it, um, including the spring on the outside. <clears throat> 
As we continued taking the fill out of the cellar, we identified what we were pretty sure is a bulkhead entrance. There's an opening in the cellar wall here. The cellar wall runs right across here. This bulkhead entrance is um, quite intriguing. Um, you'll notice there's a cut right through the middle of that entrance. It's associated with a drain that ran across the floor, and actually that drain ran all the way across the site, as you'll see. Um, in excavating the fill in that drain, which is from the early fort period, um, this is a, a fully grooved axe. Um, and so we have, do have some Native American remains from the site. Uh, we have some pottery, um, some flakes, and a, a few projectile points. Um, while we were excavating down in that um, opening in the cellar, um, they, we identified a, a discrete deposit of a lot of ceramics, glass, bone, um, and um, ashes. And we were surprised because the material on top uh, had a lot of architectural uh, debris in it, um, and it seemed to be quite different. Um, right here we have um, uh, salt glazed stoneware, uh, nice hand-painted porcelain. This is all early tin, tin glaze earthenware, German stoneware, Staffordshire, um, more Chinese export porcelain. Um, and this is a piece of, of Wedgwood. Um, Wedgwood came up with that uh, gre a green um, coloration in about 1759. Okay, these are just some of the other artifacts from, from that deposit. Um, here's a, a sugar bowl with an eagle motif on it. Um, and this green, the, this is another piece of that green plate. And we were thinking, okay, well, it must be associated with the Parks family, even though the green plate is fairly early. Uh, the green plate also looked like it was practically brand new uh, when it was broken, very little wear on it. Um, there's another, uh, another view of it. Um, it. This is the same green plate uh, that was found in Williamsburg um, at one of the tavern sites and, and dates right to that per period, about 1759. Um, another thing that was found in that deposit um, was what is called a winged cherub. Um, this is a, a religious icon, religious motif, and um, is, is very rare. I've never even seen anything like this. This is the back of it. You can see there's a little hole there that's threaded. Um, it would have had a little screw so it could have attached to something, probably clothing or even leather or a satchel. Um, and you can see it's very small. Um, a study was done back in the 70s, um, a very well-known grave study looking at the popularity of different um, religious motifs, icons on gravestones, um, starting with the death's head, the cherub, and then the urn and willow. And as you'll see, the cherub starts, its popularity begins right around 1760 um, and then goes to about 1800. Well, all of a sudden, we realize, well, here we have Jacob Bailey living at the site from 1761 to 1767. And so the plate that we found, the green plate, fits that beautifully. This um, winged cherub is certainly uh, curious you know, as to know why, why would anybody else other than a, a religious person have something like that. So the present hypothesis is that this deposit may actually be associated with uh, Jacob Bailey's tenure there, um, the building that he was living in at uh, the fort may very well have been fairly close to this area. The building was gone where the cellar is, but he would have deposited his trash. It was just a close area to, to throw his trash down. Um, it's, and this is, um, Jim Lehman just published a book on, on Jacob Bailey just quite recently. Um, this is just to point out um, how uh, we have r remains going literally right up to the edge of the foundation of the house. We were totally amazed that the house, moving of the house did not destroy this area or, or damage it. And we think they actually dug out the cellar underneath the house from the far end. They just came in and dug it out and didn't, didn't uh, disturb the area and then set the, the house down in, in place. Um, on the east side of the house, I'm just going to go over a little bit of that area very quickly, is where we, we focused on a lot of the Palisade trenches. Um, this was an early trench. Um, and in, in um, the top of some of the fill in the top of one of those, you have a, a pile of um, uh, trade beads, glass trade beads on the right, and then lead shot on the left. And these are all found together, um, very likely in a little satchel that was lost and, and tossed in, but very likely at the time that they, 
tore down the old fort and built the new one because it was right in the top of the um, Palisade fill. Also, we found a discrete deposit of eight martens. Martens are very well known for their fur, and uh, we think uh, they were in a few of the post holes, and we think when the posts were pulled out, um, and, and out of the ground, then the, in, in 1755, um, this was just something that was around and they uh, had no use for the bodies, but they wanted the fur, so they just tossed the, the bodies into the holes. Um, on the east side of the house, on the river side, at one point we were working and we found an area of stones um, outside of the main fort area. We had no idea what it might represent. It took us a while to be able to open the area up, but it turned out to be a, a chimney base, very simple, about nine feet wide. We couldn't figure out what it, what it could be, but it was possible that it might be associated with the early garrisons, since it was um, se separate from the fort. Um, we were able to open the area up, and you open it up even further, nice and dry as you can see there. Um, here's the uh, chimney base here. And at this point, we, we really wanted to try to find additional evidence of the structure that that chimney was associated with, because that would give us information about um, you know, what the structure was in its time period. We did not find anything associated with the structure other than that chimney base. Um, as a result, uh, we, we are interpreting this actually as the original garrison, 20, 1721 garrison, um, and we believe it was a log structure that was built right on top of the ground. They didn't even bother putting stones down, but they um, laid the logs right on the ground. Okay, and now I'm gonna, now this is the quick interpretation of, of what all these different features mean. Uh, a chronological run through. So there's that, that chimney base. This is the approximate size of the structure. Um, we were able to suggest the size based on the stone wall that was here. And that stone wall, okay, this is the, we don't know if that garrison house was one story or two story. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk with um, a chimney expert Jer Jeremy Irons in the area. I want to see if he might have some ideas, uh, but it could, it could have been a you know, larger structure. We just don't know at this point. And we may, ne may never know. Um, by 1723, so that was the garrison 1721. 1723, uh, the fort actually gets built. So the garrison is right in this area. There's a stone wall, that massive, a, a large stone wall, and we believe that it actually connects down to the stone wall that we got across the road that, that's built on top of the brickyard. So that makes the brickyard earlier, so the, they were probably making bricks for the first fort, and this is actually the perimeter wall of the, of the first fort. Now inside that, we have a drain, as I mentioned. We have a cistern, here let me uh, focus in a little bit. The drain, cistern, um, here's um, Ed's, Ed's uh, cellar, um, and then we have another cellar here that we've been excavating. We know that actually dates to the first fort period and the later fort. Um, this cellar, of course, was filled in. Um, potential for structures associated with all, with all of those remains. Uh, definitely a building here so that the cistern and the drain would have been underneath the floor, a separate structure here with the cellar, and then we haven't quite figured out how the structure worked here. So this is 17, basically 1723 to 1740. Um, however, um, possibly, let's see what's going on there. Okay, um, this is around uh, sometime during the first fort period. That drain that ran across the site got filled in and a small brick pavement, um, it gets built right on top of the fill for that drain. Um, and so that changes the way things are, uh, the way they would have appeared, and also a chimney base gets um, built. We haven't quite figured out how that building would have looked. By 1740, all of that's torn down, filled in, um, the fort gets expanded, um, the outer palisade, and an additional palisade gets here, it gets constructed there. Um, we don't really know how this area is associated with the later fort, wh what was going on there. Um, this is our rough idea of uh, the second fort. Um, here's your cobble pavement, brick pavement. Um, this is a big, large central chimney. There's an opening right here, a stoop, that would have come right into the chimney where it should, based on the building practices from that time period. 
Next to that was probably a ramp going into the building. Um, let's see, this cellar was also being used with an opening to get into the cellar here. Uh, a, a separate palisade over here and still the old palisade continuing to be used. You'll notice obviously the garrison house has been torn down. And the reason we know that uh, when it was torn down is because this palisade line went right through that chimney base. And so again, the association told us we know about when the, when the palisade was built. Um, the, long, the building that was there starting in 1740 to 1755, we believe looked very much like the building at Fort Western today uh, without the shingles on it. It would have been a lar large, long uh, log building with at least two central chimneys. We think uh, right at the end of the season we may have hit uh, the remains of a second um, central chimney, but we'll, we'll wait and find out. Um, and courtesy of Ed, a helicopter view of the end of the season. Um, I'll just point out that we still have quite an area to open up over here to uh, reveal more of the earlier fort and the later fort. Um, it's a uh, daunting task since we, instead of having, what, eight months that we've had before, we only have three, um, and our money may be running out the end of April. So uh, if you know anyone who would be um, Interested in um, helping us with some funding, please, please let me know. I also want to add that we've had a tremendous volunteer program. A number of, of people who are here, who are here tonight, have been participating. Um, we're going to continue that and we'll send out an email uh, to people to get, try to get some pe more people to come out. And in the back of the room on the table um, is some uh, volunteer information. Uh, Kathy Bridge, who's also here tonight, and was our former contact person. Um, Bill Burgess, who's on our staff, is going to be taking over the, the volunteer uh, efforts. But if you um, accidentally contact Kathy, she'll probably direct you in the right direction. And that's it. Thank you very, very much. Yes, the Adams are incredibly wonderful people. Yeah, <laughs> very patient. They had no idea any of this was there. Um, they uh, they gave us permission for the initial testing, and then the second round of testing, and then obviously once it was clear that the the bridge was coming. Um, they uh, had to give, give permission again. They didn't have to, but they did. Um, the DOT, unfortunately, they, they've now purchased the house. Um, it's going to be demolished um, unless the contractor, um, by hook or by crook, finds a, someone to take the house, to, to move it. Um, that was brought up at a meeting. I actually brought it up and, and um, got quite a few blank stares. And so there it seems to be very little interest in that. But it would, it's, the house is actually in quite good shape. Um, and it would be, be nice to, to have it preserved. Um, the, the house, it's the original 70, um, 1891 house with the L. The back part is, is a newer addition. Going down to the river from the fort? Um, historically, there was, some, there was um, one uh, documented source suggested there was a brick walk down to the river. Um, in, in this, uh, for this fort site, um, it seems the most likely way to get down to the river would have been down to the ferry landing um, because it's a nice flat area. You could pull bo boats right up there. Um, but we did not, uh, we weren't able to, to find that. Um, we think that the uh, south, that where the park is and on the south side, so it would have gone right through that area, um, there's a considerable amount of fill on the, on the south side of the park. And it may be some of the fill that was taken out of the road cut actually. Um, but yeah, we haven't found that. I will add too that the park portion um, is going to be preserved. So that part of the fort will be preserved. Um, from our testing, we think that may be part of the fort that doesn't have very many buildings in it. it may have been the part of the uh, open portion of the fort. The, road that the original approach road. road yeah. Saw yeah. Um, yeah, the, the question was, you know, was, was there um, any work done when they built the bridge? At that note, um, the work, the uh, mitigation work, um, comes under the National uh, Historic Preservation Act of 1966. So at that time, in 1930, there were no laws in place really to, to ensure that to happen. So no, um, I, we even checked with the DOT to see if they might have any documentation you know, from a field engineer or someone who might have made a few notes of, oh, geez, we're finding all kinds of amazing things as we're bulldozing, but there's no, no information at all. 
No, they're going to take up the pavement, um, and it's supposed to lie on top of the Fort Well, so we'll be able to document where that is. Um, and then they'll cover it over, and actually the, the park will be extended northward a short distance, and then they'll have a, a new uh, bank that will go up to the bridge. The new bridge is going to be very high. They're going to be filling, bulldozing, and then filling in much of the area where we're working. Yeah. Um, we are required to provide a, um, a report of all, all of the work that we've done. Um, we already have submitted a phase one report and a phase two, and so we'll do a, a, our data recovery report. And then we're all extremely excited about this project, obviously, and so we want to produce a, a monograph um, after that um, that expands, I mean, just, that will make use of the MineIt uh, account book, um, just looking at, John's been actually been doing some research, trying to understand where some of the individuals, um, over 100 people, are, are located, you know, where, where are they living, um, just trying to find out you know, how they're associated with the fort or how many people are living in the fort over, the, over, the time, over time. There's also a, a fantastic body of information associated with Native Americans, the treaties that were all going on, and how the fort actually came to be. I haven't talked about that at all, but that's what the whole context that we want to create uh, for, you know, for that document. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.